Good morning. It is good to be with you again, and welcome to those of you who are joining us by Zoom this morning. Uh, so this week, Wednesday, marked the start of Lent. It was Ash Wednesday. I always kind of, you know, recognize that when on Tuesday you go to Dutchway and there's Boss Knot Donuts everywhere, and it's like, well, tomorrow must be Ash Wednesday. Uh, and so, uh, but uh, a devotional that I was listening to uh, on Wednesday this week just struck me with the following words as it was kind of introducing us and helping us to reflect on the season of Lent that we enter into. And it said, in the Bible, ashes symbolize mortality, are used to express grief, and are also a sign of repentance. At the beginning of Lent, some church traditions burn palms used in the previous year's Palm Sunday celebration, and used the ash to mark a cross on the forehead of members of their congregation. This reminds them of their mortality and prompts them to examine their hearts and get right with God. And that was from Jill Weber, who was writing in this devotional. And some of the, the common words that are spoken on Ash Wednesday, that people would come up and uh, the cross, and the, with the ashes is placed on them are, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And also, repent and believe the good news. God longs for you to be whole. And this morning uh, is the last, as we are continuing talking about the kingdom of God, we are looking and looking at the signs of the kingdom. We are looking today at one of the, the final signs of the kingdom, and that it involves death, it involves mortality, right? But it's specifically Jesus and his power over death. And I thought as we, as we enter into Lent, we have this beautiful picture uh, of both our own frailty, our own mortality, but also the beautiful picture that we look forward to at Easter and as we see in the signs of the gospel that Jesus has power over death and his longing for us to be whole. So if you would turn with me, we're gonna look at a couple of different uh, narratives uh, in Luke and uh, also referencing John 11 as well, to look at this king that we have, who we serve, who has power over death. And the first, turn with me to Luke 7, uh, verses 11 through 17. And I'm just gonna read, uh, the, read the words. I don't have anything up on the screens this week. Uh, I am. Sarah is away, and things have been a little wild, so there is no PowerPoint this week. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, uh, just, just listen or read along with me. The word, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us. They said, God has come to help his people. The news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. It's an amazing passage, an amazing account. In Luke, he, he presents the raising of the widow's son right after the healing of the centurion's servant. And you often have in Luke an interesting combination between uh, God intera Jesus interacting uh, with a man like the centurion, and here he's now interacting with a woman, the widow. And so you see paralleled both his attention to a Roman centurion and here to a widow, and the focus is heavily on her. If you look at that first part, uh, notice how often she is mentioned. Uh, she is, uh, she is, it is described that this son is the only son of his mother, that she was a, a widow, the crowd was with her, the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, he spoke, he speaks to her, and he returns the son, he gives him back to his mother. 
She is very centralized in this narrative. And importantly so because as a widow who had lost her only son, she would be on the very uh, margins of society. She would epitomize those who uh, Luke presents as the gospel coming to the poor, right? She is, uh, she is alone. She is alone. And Jesus attends to her. Uh, this episode also recalls to mind Luke's readers and those hearing it would have recognized the works of the prophets Elijah and Elisha from the books of First and Second Kings, who both also uh, raise sons, raise uh, sons who have died. Uh, and interestingly, Elisha's miracle uh, occurs on the very same hill where this one does. So the town is called Nain here in the Gospels, and in the town of Shunem are both located on the same hill, the hill of Moray in the Jezreel Valley. And so there's many ways that Jesus is pointing us back that he is uh, in the line of the works of the prophets uh, and the ways that they, uh, they restored life. And we, here we see Jesus also restoring life, uh, but doing so in a way that magnifies who he is and his greatness, uh, greater than those who had come before him. And I just want to look, um, as we look at this narrative, and uh, also going to reference a few others, I'm, I'm struck by Jesus' response, the way that he responds here. Uh, this is, uh, you kind of almost have the sense that he comes across this whole scene as they're coming out of the town gate. Uh, the child has died and he is on, uh, they're carrying him out. Uh, and Jesus encounters them at the gate. And notice that Jesus sees uh, he sees her, and it says he has uh, compassion, right? His heart went out to her. Uh, and, and I'm struck by the fact that Jesus sees and knows. Uh, he sees those, and he knows those who are in mourning. Uh, he sees and he experiences compassion with them. Uh, and this, this phrase that the Lord saw and that his heart went out is used several times in the Gospels, and it's very striking uh, other places. So when the Samaritan man, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, when he is going along the road, the Samaritan sees and notices the man along the side, and he picks him up, and he cares for him, right? In Luke, when the prodigal son returns home, his father sees him, and his heart goes out to him. This is the same language, the same language the father who sees, and his heart goes out. The Samaritan sees, and his heart goes out. Jesus sees, and his heart goes out to this woman. In Matthew, when Jesus sees the large crowd, he, the same word he sees and his heart goes out. His, he has compassion and he heals the sick. And in, later in Matthew, the parable of the master and the king, uh, the king who takes pity on his servant, he sees him, experiences compassion and cancels all his debts. In Mark 6, when Jesus sees the crowd, he has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he begins to teach them. So this is this powerful seeing of Jesus and the just the way that his heart reaches out um, and has compassion he responds and it's always it always is followed by response he doesn't just see and say oh I, I noticed that like well you know did you see what happened over there okay but when Jesus sees and he he knows he knows these people right I think there's a sense of knowing going on with the compassion he always responds it's the motion that generates uh, his, his teaching, his healing. Uh, he sees the people, he sees the, them as lost sheep. Uh, it's, it speaks of, what, of his forgiveness of the Samaritan that bandages wounds and cares for the man. Uh, and, and the father who, when he sees and experiences, what does he do to his son? He runs out and he throws a great party. He celebrates. Uh, this is the, I think, a, a seeing and a knowing that restores life. Uh, and I think, you know, as we think about uh, Jesus here, he's encountering the death of this boy, and he sees the grief of this mother. Uh, you know, it, he knows that in death, right, those, as, as those whom we love die, we are left alone, right? There's a separation that takes place. There's a cutting off. Uh, and like the widow in Nain, having lost her only son, I think we know that Jesus, as we experience death of those 
we love, he, he sees and he knows. He has compassion that really runs to the very depth of who he is. Um, and so just, you know, just one thing that I, I draw out from this powerful narrative of Jesus, uh, seeing, experiencing compassion, uh, knowing, is that even in our own grief, uh, it's a reminder to, to me that Jesus knows us, that he sees us. Uh, and that even when we can feel alone in that grief, we are, we are known by him. We are not alone. Uh, and I think it's also, as both as it calls us to reflect on Jesus seeing and knowing, it reminds us uh, that we can model the same kind of compassion, uh, the same kind of seeing and knowing, being there with people. Uh, when, you know, when we see and are present with people, uh, we just simply model the king in those things. We just, we're just present. And we, if you see, uh, and you can model that with one another. And so I think Jesus' just response here, his, uh, his ability to, to, to see and to know, to experience this compassion, is something that I think can speak to uh, the reality that he knows us, uh, and that we can, we can live that out. We can model that. Uh, and then uh, we see both in the story of the widow uh, named Jesus' compassion, and also, of course, in the, the raising of Lazarus, we also see Jesus respond emotionally uh, to death. He's angered. Uh, it's, it speaks twice. I'll read the passage here in just a minute. But in Luke, in John 11, uh, in 33 to 35, and then in uh, 38, it mentions how Jesus is deeply moved in spirit. The word is even stronger than that. He's actually, uh, and troubled, it's, it's more angry. He's actually uh, and also we see, of course, his response that Jesus wept. Everybody's favorite verse to memorize, right? Uh, but just reading, I'm just going to read the passage a little bit. When Mary, this is in John 11, starting in uh, 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. That's where he's like angered in spirit and troubled. Where have, you, where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. So what, when we look at Jesus' deep compassion, we look at his weeping, we look at the troubled, the way his spirit was troubled here, um, just something that, that strikes me that it, uh, I think from this passage is the way that, that death is not the way it's supposed to be. That it, it divides what God had made, right? God has made us both physical and spiritual. Uh, there's, you know, the intertwining of our material bodies and our souls, our spiritual bodies. And at death, you know, there's, there's kind of this fracturing, right? This, the body returns to earth, the spirit um, leaves. Uh, and so, and there's also, of course, as we've experienced, the relational reality that death breaks the bonds that we have here with one another. There's a real relational breaking. Um, and so I think the reality is that God has designed us in relationship. He's designed us as physical and spiritual wholes. That these things are, we were made to be united in these ways, both with one another, with him, uh, physically and spiritually. And so death is this distortion of it. It's a fracturing of it, of God's good design. And I think, you know, Jesus' own uh, anger and his, his grieving, I think is partly, I think there's more than one thing going on in that, but I think it's partly that he just grieves what Satan has wrecked havoc upon, the death, the destruction. And I think it is good and right for us to grieve it too. And so in death, uh, it is good and right to grieve. It is, you know, God grieves it. He weeps over it. Uh, and we imitate Jesus in our own grieving, in our own grieving over what has been wrecked asunder, over what has been broken. Uh, whether that is, you know, at times that is, of course, physical death, but also it's those other things that we can experience that feel like death, that feel like a, a fracturing that we um, had hoped to never experience. To grieve those things is to imitate God in grieving uh, what has been broken. Uh, and so, you know, it's something that I just draw out is that 
you know, it's an invitation to not run from grief and to run from actually lamenting what God calls us to lament. Um, and that he invites us, I think Jesus invites us into a journey at those times, um, a journey he partakes in, in his own weeping here, in his own compassion that he experiences um, as he also, on his walk to the cross, you know, it's, there's just the reality that death is hard, and it's, uh, and it's a horrible thing, and, uh, and yet uh, we are invited, I think, to, to lament that and to grieve it. Even in those times, um, you know, there are times where certainly uh, the physical body has, has reached a point where we understand that there is release for that person. Uh, I know for, uh, of course, for Sarah's dad who, who suffered greatly, you know, the, the goodbye is very painful. And at the same time, there is a sense of, there is a relief from knowing that he is not in pain uh, anymore. Which, uh, it just, which will get to as we continue to look at, at Jesus' words and his, and his actions here in just a minute. But I just wanted to highlight, Jesus, I think, also experiences in, in John this anger, this upset. Also because as he looks around, there's a lack of understanding uh, of what Jesus can do. We see, um, interestingly, in both John 11 and then the other uh, episode in Luke, so there's, there's like three resurrection, or Jesus being, illustrating his power over the grave. There's the, the boy that we read uh, in Nain, the widow's son. And then also in Luke 40 to 56, we have the story of Jairus and his daughter, the synagogue ruler and his daughter. And then of course in John, there is the, the raising of Lazarus. So I'm, I'm referencing all three of those uh, at different points here. But interestingly, uh, in John, of course, as I had mentioned, you have where uh, after, um, after Jesus wept, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Um, and right after that, it says Jesus again is troubled in spirit. There's a sense of these people don't yet still see who I am. They don't yet know who I am. Uh, and in the story of Jairus, uh, coming to Jesus, and he, he comes, and he, he um, bows down before him, and he asks him to come because his daughter is very sick. And on his way, of course, the woman who is hemorrhaging reaches out and touches his cloak, and he encounters her, and he meets that woman. Um, and then after that, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood, then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Uh, so I'm, I'm struck in, the, in these accounts, both in, um, in John and here with Jairus and his daughter, uh, that many heard and saw Jesus, but they were still grappling, right? They were still grappling with what he could truly do. There was still this sense um, you know, they were like, well, if he'd been here in time or if he'd gotten there, uh, then he could have done something. There's still, there's, Jesus is still revealing and uncovering who he is, and he's still asking the people into places of deeper trust. It's, it's, it's interesting to me that to Jairus' parents, right, he said just, uh, I'll just read it. He says, uh, after the, uh, where he says, he said, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Um, that they could have, you know, they could have said, like all the other people, like, you don't need to come out any further, you know. They could have just told him to go. They could have responded in a lot of different ways. But they continued to walk with him into that room, trusting that even though everyone, you know, that he could yet do something. Um, and 
it just, it asks, it strikes me that God, he, he's looking, he's asking his people, right, to continue to trust him. Even when those others were laughing, the people that were, well, they walked past were laughing at him. Uh, even when it defied uh, the, the woman who reaches out to touch his cloak, uh, she had been hemorrhaging and bleeding for 12 years, so she would have been unclean in the eyes of everyone around. She would have been socially ostracized and unclean, and yet she reaches forward and she touches him uh, and, and is healed. And she, you know, she trusts that if she can get to Jesus, healing will be found. Uh, and so both the woman who's hemorrhaging uh, and Jairus' parents, they, they continue to, to look to Jesus, right? They continue to see to trust in, in who he is. And I think it's a, it's a model, it's a picture when you have, uh, you know, will, uh, will we walk with him, trust him into these, in these places, into these areas um, where it, you know, you might think, I don't know what he can do or if he can do anything, but, you know, can I, can I trust him? Can I walk with him uh, to see, you know, what he's capable of, of who he is. Um, it, it raises questions for me. Do I long for Jesus as this woman longed to touch him, to be healed, to uh, defy social conventions? Uh, there's a lot of uh, conventions that Jesus is busting through in these narratives. Uh, it's uh, in many places he, I was reading this, when he touches the funeral beer that's being carried out, he's encountering death and that would be very unclean, right? Um, when he goes to the grave, tombs are unclean. I mean, it's fine to make yourself unclean for a while um, for all these practices. Uh, but the woman is unclean and death is unclean. And here uh, in the Old Testament, the uncleanness laws kept you away from the temple. You couldn't go to the temple if you were unclean because there was a division between uh, there was the holy and there's the common. And within the common, there's clean and unclean. And you have to be clean to encounter the holy. And here we have the holy God encountering the unclean in a very powerful way, encountering death. And what we find is that when God's holiness in Jesus encounters death, he transforms it. He transforms it back to life. And it's just a beautiful picture of the way, you know, you think of the holy of holies as um, God's not sitting in the temple. He's out walking among the people and his holiness, um, his very presence is transforming and bringing back life. And he's asking, you know, do you long for this life? Do you long for that? Um, will I, you know, that's one of the questions that this, some of these passages raised for me. And will I continue to trust and follow even when it doesn't make sense in the eyes of others, right? Didn't make sense for his parents to walk in there. Uh, the girl was, she was dead. Uh, and yet Jesus playing with the word asleep because you could use asleep to talk about death or sleeping says, no, she's just sleeping. Uh, but he's, he's, he's inviting them to see even greater who he is, um, that these people would experience, be some of the first to experience the resurrection power of Jesus in these ways, his ability to restore uh, life. And so just my final point, uh, at least I think it is. <laughs> we'll find out. No, maybe I'll throw in one more. No, uh, is that Jesus, of course, throughout these encounters, so he, he knows, we know that he, he sees and knows people in their mourning. We know that he invites us into mourning and lamenting over what um, has been destroyed, rendered asunder. Uh, we know that he invites us into deeper faith with him. And lastly, uh, we see that he truly does have power over death and that he is the resurrection and the life. Uh, we see this, I'm just gonna look a little bit at each of the three episodes. When he raises the widow's son, you know, he goes up, he touches, uh, he's touching the funeral bier, and all he does is speak. He says, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. When he encounters Jairus' daughter, as we read, he says, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Uh, and then, of course, his words in John, before he goes to the tomb, he is talking, and he says, uh, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
the one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Uh, and she responds that she, that she does. And then at the tomb, they take away the stone in verse 41. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you were always... Uh, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face, and Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Oh. And so we have a powerful, beautiful, wonderful picture um, of how Jesus speaks, young man, my child, Lazarus, you know, get up, come out. Uh, the king has called them back to life. One, one commentator I read said that uh, people have said that he, had, he says, Lazarus, come out, because if he had just said, come out, all the graves would have burst open. <laughs> so he has to specify who's coming out. I don't know, I don't know, but it's kind of a, a neat picture in a way. Um, but he displays, right, in his ability to speak uh, life to death, he displays his authority and power, his, that he has power, that God has power over the grave and over death. Um, he demonstrates his superiority over the prophets of old, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, it's interesting when you read those stories, they laid on the bodies. They you know, all Jesus has to do is speak. All he has to do is speak. He crosses, as we talked about, he crosses the purity boundaries, making himself ritually impure. But the holy, holy God encountering uh, death transforms it back to life, restores it to wholeness. Uh, and we see in Luke, as he has laid out these stories, uh, in Luke 8, you go from, as we talked about through the signs of the kingdom, we go from Jesus uh, bringing calm at the storm, right? He speaks to the wind and the sea. He heals the uh, garrison demoniac, the man who is there. Uh, and then he heals the woman with the hemorrhage and he brings Jairus' daughter back to life. And so we just see how in this whole series they're being introduced to the, to the goodness of God, the compassion of God, and the wholeness that he longs to bring and that he has power over the ways that Satan tries to destroy through chaos. Uh, through uh, sickness, uh, through death, these, these ways that Jesus demonstrates uh, that even though it can seem as if, you know, Satan is in control, he says, I have such life-giving power. Uh, and, they, and these are all become pointers, right, that to Jesus' own encounter with death and that Jesus enters death, right, in order to conquer death on our behalf. And that the cross of Christ becomes his throne. Uh, the thorns is crowned and, and ashamed and humiliated king. But by entering death, he's going to defeat it. And he's going to defeat Satan. And he's going to defeat the power of death he has. Uh, because Satan has no right to him. And could not hold him. He atones for us. He frees us. And he will restore us. And so that... As he said, the death that we experience here is not final, but is just a passage, right, to life with him and to our resurrected bodies one day. And so that we see in these passages that, that one of the signs, of course, of Christ's kingdom is that he is the giver of life. He not only offers us resurrected life, but new spiritual life. He offers us that life in the present to be part of the kingdom spiritual life that he longs to give. He can both restore physically, but I think we also see the beauty that he restores spiritually. I haven't talked about as much as that, but when he talks to um, Nicodemus, he talks about being born again, right? That he's like, well, how, how can a baby come out? Like, how does that work? And it's the same kind of power, right? He can show the power to restore uh, physical life even more the beautiful power to restore our spiritual lives uh, and to bring us wholeness. And so just as we wrap up kind of these signs of the kingdom that we've been talking through for February, um, you know, again, they attest to his, Jesus' identity. 
that he gives life, oh, that he's the defeater of death and the grave. They depict the work of the king as one who restores to wholeness. They give us a glimpse of that eternal kingdom where there is no more death um, and that we long for. And it's an invitation, right, to follow, to become a part of that kingdom, to experience life now and know that as we, as we move towards death and even as each of us enters death, uh, that we're called to entrust ourselves into his hands, right? The hands of our king uh, as those who remain, you know, a king who we know has the power of life. Uh, and as those of us, as, you know, as we watch loved ones die and friends die, um, I think we are called both to grieve, uh, to rem but also to remember into whose hands our loved ones have gone, right? We grieve, but we grieve not without hope because uh, we remember the goodness of God and his life-giving power, and that we are people of a life-giving king. And I just, uh, we are going to actually have uh, Myron and Doreen uh, come up and, and share with us as well. So uh, to, they have had, uh, well, I'll let them talk. I won't put words in their mouth. But I thought uh, as we speak about a life-giving king, I think they'll have much to share with us about his life-giving work. After which we'll do the, we'll have a, after they share, we'll have the time of. Um... Good to be back, as Doreen shared. Uh, we were, yeah, gone for five weeks. It ends up that one week of our uh, time of absence was in uh, Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, where Asbury University is, and where it just so happened that a revival broke out, uh, which um, we were able to be a, in the, uh, experience that for about a week. Uh, as I, during the time, I, I got my computer out and wrote notes uh, pretty much each day about things I was seeing, things I was hearing, uh, things I felt, or stories I heard, or testimonies I heard. So I've got like four pages. I, will, I won't go through all of that, but I'll be picking some spots and Doreen will be sharing too. Uh, just sort of to, if you haven't been reading or hearing about it, I'll just give you some overall information about this. This uh, revival started on February 8th after a uh, chapel service, and I listened to the chapel service online. It was very unremarkable. It was just unremarkable. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he shared about the love of God. Good, good topic. And I wrote down the thing that sort of struck me. He had a closing prayer. The last words of his prayer were, do a new thing in our midst. Revive us by your love. And I thought, I mean, he didn't say that like it was prophetic or anything, but I just thought, wow, some simple words that ended up being the introduction to a pretty amazing uh, several week period. After he ended, they had a, a group have a closing song. And then uh, some of the, about 15 or 20 of the students, instead of leaving, they just stayed. They just felt uh, the presence of God in a very unusual way. They stayed, they began confessing sin, they began worshiping and singing and praying for each other. And pretty soon, other students started coming, and pretty soon faculty started coming, and uh, some of the students ran into some of the classes and said, something's happening in Hughes Auditorium. Get over there. And something was happening, uh, something pretty amazing. So this has been called variously a variety of things. Is, is it a renewal? Is it a revival? Is it an awakening? Uh, or is it just a very long church service? Um, it, uh, it's certainly a remarkable work of God's Holy Spirit, whatever it may be called. This town, uh, Wilmore, is it's a two-stoplight town with one franchise of Subway, um, 6,000 people, and this town suddenly was flooded with people from dozens of countries around the world, every state in the union, people, they, they got in their cars, they threw the kids in the car, and they headed to Kentucky. They wanted to be, there's just a, a real strong sense of a hunger 
to encounter God in a very personal and real way uh, that was, was just really uh, amazing to see. Uh, the, when the, on the busiest day, they were estimated about 20,000 people were there, uh, and um, they had to close down the, the roads coming into Wilmore because uh, it was just the town couldn't sustain it. Uh, if you think of the logistics of, of things like food and water and toilet facilities and a place to sleep and seats to sit on, um, the auditorium, the main auditorium where it started was seats 1,500, and they had ended up having five overflow places, and still people were in long lines. There's half a mile long line of people waiting to get in. Uh, the cars were backed up two and a half miles uh, outside of the city. Just, I, I've never seen anything like it in all my life. Very moving. Um, and it was very moving to hear people's stories, you know, people just coming from all over. One of the most moving stories for me was this uh, woman uh, from Chile uh, shared that uh, she and her husband are co-pastors and they, they heard about this revival. Uh, but they didn't have money to come, so they sold their car so they could get airplane tickets to, to be there. And of course, along with all this, there was just lots of prayer going on, tons of prayer. Uh, you'd see small groups of people praying, and during the services, people would come up front. Um, a lot of repentance, which, which seems to be so strongly associated with revival, you know, I was thinking of how John the Baptist preceded Jesus coming, and of course he had a baptism of repentance. There's something about the repentance that prepares our hearts uh, for a move of God. So um, we were there just visiting Karis and Travis. They live a few blocks um, from Asbury University. And uh, Karis, Friday night when we arrived, about eight days after the revival began, went over uh, to take prayer team training, which was only by word of mouth. I mean, they weren't advertising it, um, but she had heard of it. So she went over to take this hour long training. And then she said, um, the next night, she said, mom and dad, why don't you go? If, if you want to pray for people and take the training. So we went and took the training. And then part of what you do when you get there is say who, you know, because they won't just let anybody come and pray. Um, and so we said, well, we know Will's dad, Dara's husband, and Will's dad actually helped started the church that many of the people that were doing the training and were on the prayer team um, belonged to. So by the next day, we were on the prayer team, <laughs> um, which was an astounding uh, op honor. Um, part of the training was talking about how when we many of us before we come to pray we're going to experience either um, fear like I, who am I I'm not going to pray the right thing this person's coming from from Argentina and they have one opportunity to come forward and I'm going to pray the wrong thing you know or I'm not going to pray with the faith that God wants me to pray with or um, nothing's going to happen you know, to them, that's the fear, or shame, like, who am I to pray? I mean, I, I just had an argument with my husband before we came, and I'm no holy person, you know, to be praying for this, um, or, or, or anger, you know, like, why doesn't, th why doesn't this kind of thing happen in my life, or why isn't my son healed, or, so he said, we just need to take those to Jesus first before we pray, and then let Jesus hold them, take them, and then give us all that we need to just show up and and pray by the power of the Spirit um, in us. Um, and so that was that was a very moving uh, thing for me. Um, the first time that we signed up, they were very organized. So they had slots, three-hour slots that you signed up for the prayer team, and then you had to go get your tag and turn your tag back in. You know, so that they were very um, careful. I think with stewarding the gift of what the Holy Spirit was doing there. Um, the first time there, we went to one of the overflows that had just been open, so there was only, I think, 50 people when we came, 100 when we left. So it was an opportunity for me, actually, just to join the live stream, what, what God was doing in, in Hughes, and um, 
to repent myself of my own lack of wholeheartedness. You know, like I hold things back from God and I think I'm going to manage this or I can keep this little part of my life um, that eh, God doesn't really care that much about this. And I just really felt like God telling me, give me everything. Um, Give me everything. And, you know, I figured I probably have 10 or 20 years left till I die. And I think I can give him everything for 10 or 20 years. (laughs) Um, I wish I'd given him everything for for longer. But um, that was my my commitment. And um, just to be more wholehearted, you know, with what I give to God. What struck me then at being on the prayer team, later on we got to be in Hughes um, as people came to the altar and and prayed for them, and then later over at Estes Chapel across the way after they closed Hughes to everybody but Generation Z, which I thought was a wonderful um, move because they just feel like this main move of God is among that generation of high school and college students. It began there. They did not allow any big-name worship groups come in they volunteered to come in and lead worship and they said no this is student initiated it will be student led so it was only worship teams from asbury students um and so they really had an emphasis on the on the students um especially towards the end they were the only ones that were allowed in uh, to the to the main event Um, but when i was praying for people some things that struck me number one is I mean, there are people from all over the world, like Myron said. It was like all colors out there. Um, And, and of course, men and women, children, babies, um, whole families were there. And it just feels like that's what heaven's going to be like. It's just like that. Um, Worshiping God. So much joy in that room. So much peace. Um, Just so much honoring of Jesus together, all of us. And People would come forward and ask for prayer. Like many came to my, many pastors came to Myron in particular. It was men to men usually that we would only pray for the. I would pray for a woman and he would pray for a man, and not. And I had a few pastor women pastors come too, and they didn't say I belong to this denomination. I, ne- I never heard that. I never heard anybody say what denomination they belong to. But it didn't matter. Yep, didn't matter. We're just we're just followers of Jesus together. Um, I had one little boy come up, um, about 10 years old. His daddy was behind him and his two sisters, and then his daddy and two sisters went to be prayed by somebody else. But he came up to me, kneeled down at the altar rail, and he said, God has called me to be a pastor, and I want you to pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit on my life. And so I prayed for him, and the tears in his eyes, I mean, he just, it was astounding to me. Um, that God would already call this young man, um, and I would get to pray for him. Another one that really meant a lot to me was a, a, a pastor. From, he's a Russian immigrant. He's a pastor of a Slavic church in one of the big Midwestern cities. His name is Valentin. Strong Russian accent. Um, and he said, I want you to pray for three things. My son David is not a believer. I want you to pray for him. I want you to pray for revival in my church. Um, And I want you to pray for my prayer group. He said, there are 10 of us pastors. We meet every Tuesday morning. Some of us are Ukrainian. Some of us are Russian. Some of us are from Belarus. We are all Slavic. Some of us are in Ukraine. And we zoom in. I want you to pray for our prayer team, that we would bring revival wherever we are, and that the war would stop. You know, so I, I mean, it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I put, I put, I asked if I could put my hand on him, and, and I put, he said yes. I put my hand on my shoulder, his shoulder, and he put it on his head. And then I asked, and then I put my other hand on his shoulder, and he put it on his head. And he just bowed his head down, and he wept the whole time that I was praying for him. And it was astounding i mean god is on the move and i just feel like it it wasn't just for us there um this we're part of gang ranks and this is for us too this is definitely for us too 
And that trip was planned long before there was a revival. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and I know you all were praying. Many, I know the older, con the Sunday school class was really praying. And so we'll, we'll be talking to them in their class next week about what happened. We spent our whole Sunday school class <laughs> talking about it. Um, but, you know, this, this is for us. This is for all of us. This touch of God. God is on the move. It's spreading. Spreading across the nation. Spreading across the world. God is on the move. Yeah, you had a sense of, somebody said when you step into the auditorium, you feel like you're stepping into the river of the Holy Spirit. And you certainly had a sense of, of being on holy ground. Uh, and, and just a beautiful uh, experience. Uh, but, you know, we have that same Holy Spirit with us here. Um, you know, there was a, there's different kinds of revivals. You know, some of them are, have, uh, some of them, you know, the Holy Spirit is a spirit, Holy Spirit of power, and some have more power manifestations. But the Holy Spirit is also a, a spirit of peace. And that was more exemplified in, in this revival. Uh, I mean, there were some more of the spectacular kind of things that weren't quite so peaceful, but the overall tone was much more of peace uh, and God's love and presence and healing. Uh, a lot of healing for emotional, um, some physical healing too, but a lot of emotional things, depression, uh, anxiety, uh, relationships, just, just a God of healing. You know, thinking as Phil was preaching, you know, we have a God of compassion. And we just we just felt that there. This is you know God is so compassionate. He cares for every all these people you know who are coming forward who just want to be touched by God. And God uh, is extending His hand and touching them in a special way. Um, there's so many stories. Uh, one story that I thought was really neat: a lady had volunteered to help out, and uh, they said, "Well, we could use you in uh, the back alcove off of Hughes Auditorium. That's the main auditorium there." And she said, okay, what do you want me to do? She said, well, people are trying to sneak into the auditorium. And, uh, and she thought, well, what an interesting problem. You know, what would that be like if we had, had to put people, you know, here at Gingrich somewhere to keep people from sneaking in to our <laughs> service, you know? <laughs> uh, what a great problem that would be, huh? Oh, my. Um, oh. People brought in, people in the community just contributed so much of their time and energy. People just dropped their jobs, you know, and uh, responsibilities and just put their whole heart and energy and time and sleep and into this. The initially, I don't know how many days, five or six days, it was 24-7. Nobody left the auditorium. Finally, they said, you know, we need to clean out this auditorium. These people need sleep. And they started closing it at 1 p.m. then for the, for the 1 a.m. Yeah, 1 a.m. for the rest of the revival so that the thing could get, you know, cleaned out. And people could get some rest. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty amazing. And prayer, you just saw prayer happening all over. I mean, it was happening up front as people came forward. It was happening out on the lawn. It was happening in the hallways. You just see two or three people here. You see a group there praying. Uh, just a lot of prayer going up for uh, all kinds of uh, desires and hopes. Uh, yeah. You know, I guess one thing I, I just want to say, too, is, you know, we don't need to go to Wilmore, Kentucky for a revival. You know, um, that Holy Spirit is here in each of us as believers. He's here in this congregation as a whole at Gingrichs, you know. And um, revival is just a matter of, you know, of our hearts. You know, we uh, come to God with us. If we can come with a spirit of repentance, you know, I ended up doing the same thing Doreen did. I, I had things to repent of. And, and if there's, a, there, there's something that happens as we repent that opens us up. And then if we can just say, God, whatever, whatever you have for me, I want that. You know, I'm reminded of uh, David's prayer in Psalm 139 where he says, you know, search my heart, O God. Uh, if, if there is anything evil, any wicked way in me, uh, know my thoughts and lead me in the way everlasting. And, you know, that's where revival starts in each of our hearts. Uh, so that would be my prayer for each of us. May we be each revived and uh, let God have his way in our hearts and in our lives.